Um, I'm Angie Newsom. I'm with Carolina Public Press and carolinapublicpress.org. I want to welcome all of you to our first Newsmakers Forum. So thank you so much for coming. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about who we are, why we're doing this event, and what you can expect today. Um, so Carolina Public Press, we're an online news service. We're at carolinapublicpress.org, and we focus on in-depth and investigative news from the 18 westernmost counties of the state. So if you think about Watauga down the Rutherford County is heading west, that's the area that we cover. We, fo we focus on public interest reporting and news that is going underreported and perhaps overlooked by our friends in the traditional press in the, in the region. In my opinion, one of those stories is what's happening with the national forests in western North Carolina. And that's what brings us to our forest lookout series, which we've been doing for the past, I guess, three weeks or so, we're going to continue to do that um, over the next month and, and longer. And really what that um, Forest Lookout series is about is taking a look at what's going to be happening with the million acres of national forest land in, in the 18 counties in the West. Um, they're undergoing a really significant replanning process. Those of you who were here 20 years ago might remember how significant it was. Um, and how it really changed the conservation movement in Western North Carolina. And so we are holding this forum, it's our first Newsmaker Forum, to really focus on our series, of, our reporting series, but also to bring people making the news and the news to you. So we kind of break down some of those barriers that the public may feel between journalists and uh, sources and readers. So it's really an opportunity for us to hear directly from a horse's mouth. Not that these folks are horses. <laughs> um, but to hear directly from the sources of the journalists making, making the news. Uh, we are going to be putting this online, too, so you can go back and look at it and share it with your friends and family. And I hope you'll do the same with the, with the reporting series that we have, too. So what we're going to do today, we only have an hour together. So the first 30 minutes, you're going to see an interview. What does it look like? How do people talk with one another? Um, and so that will just happen up here. And then the last 30 minutes is a Q&A from you all. Do you have questions that you want to ask the folks up here? Um, there's some boards in the back. If you prefer I ask your question on your behalf, I'm happy to do that. Um, but to keep it moving a little bit, we're going to ask everybody take about a minute to ask their question, and then we'll keep going. And this is really an opportunity for some thoughtful, smart, nonpartisan dialogue about these issues that we're facing, which are pretty huge. And these forests, as you all know, have tremendous environmental and economic impact in our region. And I'm really excited to hear what our panelists and what you all have to say about that. So thank you again for coming. And I'll turn it over to Jack Eidelman, who hopefully you all read some of his reporting. And he's going to be leading the first part. Yeah, thanks, thanks Angie. Awesome. Such a great crowd. I know. Uh, in the reporting I've done on this topic, just the, the passion, the emails, the, the so many people that I've talked to, it obviously is a story that really matters to so many people. And, and uh, before I throw some questions at our panel, I want to just explain really briefly my connection to the forest. And I think uh, as a journalist, so many of the stories that you do, you're not necessarily an expert on what you're writing about. It may be newsworthy, but you know we are not experts. But I feel like, uh, I wouldn't call myself a national forest expert, but I spent 10 years working with outdoor programs, the Outward Bound School and a state-run program called Camp Wilson. And so I consider the uh, national forest in Western North Carolina my home for a little while. I spent a lot of nights on the dirt. And um, I even know some of the places on the maps that are incorrectly marked. I feel like it's my, it's my neighborhood. And so uh, I've learned a lot in this reporting about uh, some of the nuance that exists in how we manage forests, the, the history, the people. The, just It's a complex topic. and. Um, uh, I really care about it, so it's been really exciting to have the opportunity to report on it. So I want to real quickly ask each of the panel members to take two minutes, and uh, I'll start with Kristen. Uh, Kristen, would you explain, and everyone, this will be the same question for you all, is uh, why are the North national forests important in North Carolina? Why should people care about this process? First, I'll just do a quick um, introduction because I'm Kristen Bale and I'm the forest supervisor for the National Forest in North Carolina. And there are four national forests, but um, here we're specifically talking about 
the Nantahala and Pisgah National Forests, which are in North, North Carolina, the um, 18 county area, and they're just shy of 1.1 million acres. And why should people care? They're your forests. I mean, this is what makes our country so great, is that there are public lands, lands that all of us can go out and enjoy. And there are different types of public lands, everything from you know, national parks to the national forests. In the west, there are lands um, that are administered by the Bureau of Land Management. But these are lands that are there for a variety of purposes, based on the laws that Congress has passed to create them. And what's really special about the national forests in the east and in uh, western North Carolina is that these lands were born from lands that had been in private ownership. And in a lot of cases, they were in pretty rough shape. Um, there was a lot of timber harvest, active management. That's just what folks did at that time. They were there to make a living, and there was a lot of logging. And so to see the forests the way they are today, after they were uh, purchased by the federal government and um, created, amalgamated into the national forests, to see them today where so many people come to visit, millions, you know, almost um, a little over seven and a half million people come to visit. Um, and they come for a variety of reasons, you know, for the scenery, to hike, to hunt, to fish. Um, and also they're a very, very important economic driver for our region. Um, we're a multiple use agency, these lands are multiple use, and so there's everything from um, a certain amount of timber harvest to a very substantial um, tourism and recreation industry that is dependent and um, uses these forests. As well as some of our um, neighboring units, the National Park Service, the Blue Ridge Parkway goes through the forest. Uh, we also have our neighbor, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. You know, so we have a great treasure here in Western North Carolina that a lot of folks come here because they want to live next door to these lands, or they want to visit these lands, and um, when they visit, they're spending money, which is a, a benefit to a lot of folks. So for me, the fact that these are your lands and they're providing a lot of uh, great services and benefits in a lot of different ways is what makes them kind of important. And from a personal standpoint, I, I love our national forests, and, and these are pretty darn neat forests in, in and of themselves, and I love the Nantan Hill and Pisgah as well, so um, it means a lot to me personally. And, uh, Chris, and I'm glad you've mentioned that. I think many of you all know, but the national parks around here, the Blue Ridge Parkway unit, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, have a completely different legacy uh, in terms of how they were created, right? We kind of created, drew a circle around where we were going to put the park, and really took the land, the national forests were created in a much different way, purchased from willing sellers, um, uh, and the national park has a focus of preservation, whereas the national forest has like this really complex, wide range of users, the multi-use mandate. Exactly. Um, Hugh Irwin from the Wilderness Society. I want to turn it over to you for a Sure. Uh, I'm a conservation planner with uh, the Wilderness Society, and uh, um, you know, going back to that history, uh, there are differences in the national park and the national forest that uh, I'd like to highlight. Uh, you know, they really grew out of the same conservation uh, initiative uh, at the turn of the 20th century. You know, there was massive logging, uh, the streams were polluted, out of control wildfire, and, you know, uh, groups of People then came together and said, you know, we have to protect this land. The, the National Park uh, was one branch of that that protected, you know, the Smokies and eventually Blue Ridge Parkway. But the we that effort led to the Weeks Act, which established, uh, you know, the Forest Service. And both of those uh, uh, efforts grew out of a realization that we had to protect uh, these lands that were being abused at that time and, uh, you know, put them into long-term planning and protection. Uh, you know, why uh, should people care about uh, uh, non hall Pisgah National Forest? One great reason is, you know, the water that we all drink, a lot of that comes from the National Forest, flows out of the National Forest, and, you know, not only the towns uh, in western North Carolina, but even further afield as those streams flow down into the rivers, you know, that becomes drinking water. Also, uh, aquatic habitat water. 
and uh, really the the national forest you know we can they're the backdrop of our life we can you know walk out and if we have a good view of the horizon we basically see non is the national forest but it's also the backbone of our quality of life you know it helps contribute to our water quality to the air we breathe to the, the experiences that we're able to to have in this area and you know Asheville regularly comes up as one of the top places to live in the United States. And one of the reasons is because of our public lands, both Great Smoky Mountain National Park, uh, Nanahal Pisgah National Forest, our state lands, all of that forms uh, a public lands legacy that contributes to our quality of life. I um, want to turn it over to Gordon Warburton. Gordon, you want to give a brief introduction of what you do and then uh, tell us why you think the North, uh, the National Forests are important and also if you talk a little bit about your history with the last plan being around for what was created. Oh, an extra little bonus question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exciting. <laughs> Throw it out there. Yeah. It's like I remember all that. So I <laughs> yeah. have a little bit of a help there. <laughs> Hi, my, my name is Gordon Warburton and I am a wildlife, a real live wildlife biologist with the North Carolina Wildlife Commission. <laughs> And I've been working out here for, for over over 30 years, and, and I did my master's work on black bears out here just south of town. Back when back, black bears were a scarce, <laughs> scarce populations, which uh, we, uh, we've recovered from. But um, yes, I. Um, uh, you want to do the? I guess I can do the my relationship to the last. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was back here right as a a, a, a budding and excited graduate student back in the early 80s. I came on board and. One of the first things they did was they, uh, my, my uh, supervisors drug me up here to the uh, to Asheville, and I spent many <coughs> happy hours in the in the <laughs> supervisor's office with the, with the planners. Boy, coming out of graduate school as a biologist, optimistic, all of a sudden you get thrown in a room with planners. That's a that's a tough road to hoe. But, but uh, we worked hard and long. Uh, we've had a the Wildlife Commission has had a long-standing relationship with the U.S. Forest Service going back to the creation of the Wildlife Commission in the late 40s. And together, we, we cooperatively, cooperatively manage wildlife resources on the uh, national forests. And so it was logical for us to help out with that, that previous plan. It had already been in operation. I started in 83, but in the late 70s, that plan started. And it took all the way to 87 to get it, to get it done. It was like 10 or 12 years or something. So, But anyway, as I, as I aged, which I, all of a sudden I woke up, and, and I was like the oldest person in the room. I was the <laughs> institutional memory for that. So. But anyway, it was it was a good plan for its time, and uh, you know, standing before you 30 years ago, I would be presenting a different case for wildlife. The pendulum was over here. Today, I'm going to stand before you, and, and that pendulum is over here. We'll talk about the pendulum later. But um, anyway, uh, that's me. Um, why are the forests important? Uh, the, uh, they're important for all the reasons that were mentioned here, and you mentioned water, certainly uh, aquatic uh, uh, resources, uh, wildlife populations, uh, terrestrial uh, as, uh, fish and aquatic uh, uh, organisms. But also, they're, 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 they're huge. I can't, I can't overstate the case for, for how important they are for wildlife. These are, especially some of our wildlife now that we find with dangerously low population levels. Um, whether you hunt or fish, or, or you like birds, or you bird watch, or you like to just generally know that, that wildlife are out there, and, and, they, and they're, they're all out there, and they're great diversity. You want to count on your public lands for, to, to be holding these wildlife species. Um, so they're places of diversity, but also places of stability. We want wildlife to be able to, to count on having their homes and places to breed and raise their young. We want to be able to count on these areas on the Forest Service land to provide these. A lot of cases on uh, outside the Forest Service land, they're, they're subject to the vagaries of, 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 of human existence. But on the forest, in the forest matrix, remember the matrix movies? We talk about the forest matrix. That's, that's where we, we want to provide some stability for, for wildlife, uh, struggling populations. Uh, and it, this goes beyond just waving a wand over and saying, we want to just protect these areas. Sometimes we are called to action. And so these are places where we actually will make the effort to create some of these habitats that are that are not we're not able to do on private land. So they're important to us in places that we can actually do things for species and create habitats that might be a little bit unpopular, a little bit unsightly at first. So, but the lastly, uh, 
National forests, as we mentioned, are not national parks. There's a different model. And uh, Hugh took us back to the, to the days of Teddy Roosevelt, the conservation, the term conservation was coined. Go back to its original meaning, uh, wise use, and the way it was applied. And so these were places, uh, uh, the national forests had a, an original mission of providing a timber supply for the country because of everything that was going on. We're cutting everything and we needed to, we needed, we knew we needed timber, but we needed to do it in a way that, that made sense. And Gifford Pinchot and beginnings of scientific forestry were, were out there for us. So uh, now the Forest Service's mission has, has gone to multiple use. Now it's all things to all people, which presents a wonderful challenge for my colleagues <laughs> <laughs> with the Forest Service down there. But uh, they are working for us. They're, they're, they're not intended to, to, to keep humans out, but for, for us to work together and blend the natural world with the, with the world of humans. This has been, been done yeah, so for gonna, I was going to add, Gordon, one thing that has struck me with uh, interacting with Forest Service people is you might have a perception of what bureaucracy looks like, but they're amazingly passionate and dedicated and knowledgeable, and that's been a, a real pleasant surprise for me to interact with at such a high level with them. So yeah, you, we've got national parks out here for those experiences. We have national forests to provide other experiences. And so those, uh, they're, they're, they're important. 22% of the land area out here, if, you, if you're doing some math out there, you know, a fifth of the land area is in public ownership out here. That, that's huge from, a, from any uh, natural resource standpoint. Yeah. So. Um, yep. Thanks, Gordon. I want to turn it over to Kevin Colbert. And one of the reasons I'll have Kevin introduce himself, he is from American Whitewater, but uh, uh, Kevin has returned to Asheville after about a decade being out west, and so he brings uh, uh, a knowledge of planning from a different region, which I think is really valuable to have. Great, thanks. Yeah, so I work for American Whitewater. It's a nonprofit organization representing whitewater paddlers and really focused on, on water quality, rivers, and river recreation. So, um, much of what I was going to say has already been said. I think that the, the value of the National Forest here, I think you probably all live here because of, of many people in Western North Carolina live here because of the mountains, right? It's part of our culture, it's part of our identity, it's a visual backdrop of our lives, and I think that the mountains here uh, provide a sense of, of uh, kind of sublime beauty and peace and nature for a lot of people. Um, People could live anywhere in the country, but they choose to live here, I think largely because of the mountains and what they provide. So, um, and that includes people that start businesses, start families. Uh, you know, I think that the, the mountains here in the National Forest in particular, they don't just drive economies that are based in the mountains, they drive the economy of the whole region, I think. Um, so I'll focus for a minute on why people should care, um, and really why people should care about the planning process. Uh, the planning process, it, comes along once every 10 to 20 years, uh, and it really charts the direction of change for the forest. And Gordon mentioned a pendulum. You know, there is management direction where um, maybe it's conservation or recreation or timber or wildlife. There, there are directions of change that happen during planning, and they're happening right now through this process. And if you have a vision of why you love the forest, or what you'd like to see on the forest, this is kind of your once in a generation <clears throat> opportunity to affect change. So that's why we're here. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Sure. Yeah, it's interesting. And when I came here in the early 90s working in the outdoor field, I had no idea there was a process going on or, or anything about it. So, hey, you know, older and wiser now. But, Kristen, would you take a couple minutes to sort of uh, give an overview? of the planning process. We've talked about a couple pillars that it has, just a, like a quick snapshot for people who may not be familiar with the components of what's actually happening. Sure, yes, so uh, we are in the middle of revising our current plan. It was originally drafted in 1987. So a little bit has changed since then. I think uh, we would probably all agree on that. There was a substantial update to that in the mid-1990s, but still very much um, needing to be refreshed and renewed and um, figuring out what's working and what's not for um, the folks that are here today and looking forward into the future because a plan influences not just how we experience the forest today, uh, but what will be there for our um, kids and their grandkids. So, um, because a lot of the restoration work we do may be 
looking ahead to what will be on the ground in the, in the distant future. So um, why do we plan in the first place? Well, the easy answer is that we have to. It's part of the National Forest Management Act passed in 1976. Um, but it's, it's a way for us to describe um, what the forest is going to look like. Um, it's kind of called in our terminology desired future conditions. So to be able to say, you know, for these different areas, we're going to have these different desired future conditions so that folks <coughs> can understand. Um, I kind of um, equate that a little bit to zoning, you know, which a lot of folks are, are more familiar with. Um, so that is one what we call component of the plan that is developed. Um, another is um, we develop what are called management areas, which are the actual kind of um, lines on the map where we um, put those desired future conditions and say, okay, for this landscape, this is the type of desired future condition that we'd like to see. And then from there, we get a little bit more specific and go into standards and guides. And essentially, those are the more specific ways that we get at moving towards that desired future condition. Stand Standards are more of those sideboards that we're going to use, and guides are um, those things that um, show intention, but they're not, not quite as rigid. So if you use a planning example, and like let's say, and I'm just going to make it up, you have a planning zone that's high density, and you would have um, a desired condition as far as you know what that area would look like. And then a standard might be, okay, we don't want to have any buildings that are higher than five stories, you know, and that would be kind of the, uh, you know, the sideboards that you would operate under. Um, and then another one might be, well, we, we um, want most of the buildings to be brown and gray, but, you know, we're not going to require that. And that would be more of a guideline. So it's, it's something that, you know, shows intent, but it's not, you know, going to be rigid. It, it, someone goes and wants to maybe have green for the color. It's not going to be absolutely prohibited, but you're definitely going to have to prove why that's, you know, compatible with that desired future condition. So that's just a very, um, you know, simple off-the-cuff, you know, comparison of what the plan does. But it does it for our forests. And there are a variety of things out there. There are, um, you know, Gordon talks about wildlife. There are different um, experiences, both recreation, um, you know, wild areas that have a more um, wild, untrammeled um, experience, areas that are um, more um, actively managed for either recreation, where you're going to run into a lot more people, like, you know, sliding rock, for example. You know, you're not going to go out and expect to have no one else there at sliding rock. You know, that's going to be more of a developed, intensive recreation experience. Um, and then also, um, you know, timber harvest is used as a tool, um, but not an end of itself, to reach desired conditions. You know, in some places we're wanting to recover oaks, and that might mean um, making a few openings because the oaks like that sunlight. There may need, be a need to um, cut down white pine because we want to put something else there. We might need to thin the forest just because it, um, with, with the trees that we want to keep there will grow better if they thin it. And in some areas it's just not, um, timber harvest won't be used as a tool because it's just not compatible with those desired future conditions. And those are the real key things to focus on is painting that picture of what we want there and then there will be a lot of different ways to get there that will be all part of that public conversation. So um, we're in that process now. We're um, the last of six public meetings, and we're sharing some initial ideas. We, throughout this process, we've um, you know, kind of come up with an initial proposal. We've shared it with folks. We've, been, we've asked for feedback. We take that feedback and then and then refine it. And we're also in that um, phase now where we're actually thinking of some conceptual kind of zone areas, we call them management areas. Um, we have some initial ideas on desired future conditions, but are very much um, wanting to have that public input, input from you all, from all the different perspectives of what all different folks care about, um, to help guide us as we move forward. And then we develop what's called a draft plan, and we have alternatives to that plan, because there's um, a spectrum of opinion out there. You know, there's not one thing that works for everybody. So we um, intentionally will have, you know, kind of a, a proposed plan out there and look at a variety of ways that um, management can be approached in a variety of different um, end objectives. So we can show the trade-offs of, of the different things. If you do a little bit more of this, you might not be able to do as much of that. And that's all part of um, helping to make an informed choice, which is eventually, um, you know, a plan that will guide the future um, for the next 15 years or so. So um, it's uh, it, an important process because it's not only what they'll look like today, but what they'll look like in the future. And uh, Kristen, I think is the last 
public meeting of the current round of meetings, is that? That is tonight in Marion, yes. Marion, uh -huh. yes. so uh -huh. check that out. There was a round of six uh -huh. public meetings that happened throughout the region. This one's the six uh -huh. in Marion. Yeah, and that's just one way for us to, show, to share information with y'all one-on-one. We post things online. Um, so folks that aren't able to, to get out there because, you know, folks do work for a living, um, you know, you, you're able to go on there. Uh, we want your comments at any time, but we have said, you know, if, if you want to comment on this, this is the best time for you to comment on this type of topic. Because things do progress and move forward, so if you wait until the very end, it might be awful hard for us to, to really be able to thoughtfully consider your comment because, you know, it, the, the process is um, intended to move forward. Um, so, uh, we've had a whole series of public meetings already. Thousands of comments have been received. This is just the latest in a series. We'll have more um, once we're able to share out with you a draft plan and um, a document, the environmental impact statement that talks about the alternatives and analyzes the trade-offs of the, those alternatives. And then we'll be getting more input because that's still, this is still very much a work in progress. And uh, hopefully by the end of 2016 we'll have our plan. Thanks, Kristen. I want to pop back to Kevin for a second. Sure. And one of the, Kristen mentioned the, the uh, federal, management, uh, <laughs> federal Management Land Act. Did I get that right? <laughs> that, that's okay. It's, it, the law that says thou shalt have Yes, there we go. Land. I get the acronyms <laughs> messed up. But it was in 1976, and one of the big pieces of that was it was intended to draw the public to participate, which is what Kristen's been explaining. And I... Kevin, I'd like your perspective on being part of uh, planning out west in Idaho and Montana. Sure. And the landscape is totally different here. It's obviously big sky, more spread out there. But what's your impression of the participation from the public here relative to out west? How, how do you think the process has gone engaging them? So far, I think it's gone really well. And you know, the Forest, the forest Service came out with a new planning rule in 2012. And it has a lot of discretion in it, and it just kind of said, go try some things to these first forests. And every forest tried a little bit different approach. And what I think has been really cool and really impressive is that the Forest Service is learning from those that came before them in real time. So something happens in a meeting that's kind of weird in Idaho, two weeks later they fixed it in California. Two weeks later they fixed it here. So they're really learning as they go. Um, an example I'll give in Idaho, they tried a pretty big collaborative process that required the public to go to them. So maybe it's a meeting that's, you know, you have to drive six hours over a mountain pass to get to. And if you can't get to the meeting, you, you really don't have the same level of input as someone that goes to the meeting. Well, here, the Forest Service is going to the people. They're driving around. They do this road tour in the evenings. You know, many meetings, think about the you know, impact this has on their staff. Feel you know, like out there in the evenings, uh, many rounds of meetings. Um, I think it's going really well, and I think that there's also an online component that recognizes that not everyone that uses this national forest lives here, and people may not want to travel from Atlanta or Florida to go to a meeting um, or to go to ten meetings to, to provide input, but they care about this place and national forests. People live elsewhere. Maybe there's a kayaker that lives in. Florida, and this is the closest whitewater they've got, and they love this place. So they're able to file comments online, see maps online. Um, so I think it's a great combination of public meetings where the Forest Service is going to the people, and this online component that recognizes the national perspective. And you, and explain just real briefly, what are what is American whitewater? At, I think we could probably take a guess at it, but what is American whitewater specifically advocating for in yeah. this current planning process? Good question. Okay, so right now in Western North Carolina, there's over 300 dams, and there's only three wild and scenic rivers. And well, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act was written as a counterbalance to hydropower development. And so one of our roles here is to make sure that the Forest Service is protecting a suite of rivers that could one day become wild and scenic and be protected from hydropower development. So it's a great chance for the public to weigh in on which streams are just really special, and which streams should not change over time. Um, so that's one of the big things. And also recognizing the role that outdoor recreation, human-powered outdoor recreation, plays in the regional economy, in the culture, and the lifestyle, and to have um, a good perspective that makes sure the recreation is managed sustainably so that it, it protects the environment, because that's why we go outside. We don't go outside just to play. We go outside to play and open ourselves to, to nature. 
And you know, so something that both is sustainable management, but also positive, and recognizes that recreation isn't a, a bad thing that they have to deal with, but a good thing that they should be providing for. So yeah. I'd say those two things, kind of conservation of, of rivers and water quality, and also a, a welcoming positive um, sustainable recreation approach. And this is, I, I think the number, I think I have this right, but our national forests in Western North Carolina are the third most visited in the, uh, he was shaking his head good, I got it right, yeah. third most <laughs> visited yeah. national forest unit in the country. And if you've been to different parts of it, you know, some are, are really heavily used in our parts. Emerged as one of the big issues is looking at recreation. The, the other issue, and I want to, before we turn it back uh, to open it up to questions, I want to give uh, both Hugh and Gordon a little more to expand on one of the other issues that has emerged in the planning process, which is looking at protecting uh, 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 more swaths of land for uh, uh, greater protection, such as wilderness, and uh, uh, versus or in collaboration with also managing more forest for habitat, which means uh, uh, more uh, timber harvesting. So I want them to take a couple minutes, which is not nearly enough time to be able to explain some of the nuances of the argument, but you can tune in to Carolina Public Press and read more about that oh, later, right? It's a teaser. Uh, and she told me I was supposed to do that. But, uh, anyway, Hugh, would you take a couple minutes yeah, to explain sure. what the Wilderness Society is advocating for? Um, under NFMA, which is the act that you know governs planning, uh, there's provision for uh, consideration of areas for potential wilderness recommendation, and you know only Congress can uh, designate wilderness. The Forest Service plays the role of uh, identifying potential areas, evaluating them, and recommending uh, them for wilderness designation. And uh, of course, being the Wilderness Society, we're very interested in that, and. You know, we've cataloged a number of areas throughout Mount Hall Pisgah National Forest uh, that uh, are important special areas. Uh, you know, not all of them are wilderness candidates, certainly, but the, there's a whole spectrum of areas in here that, uh, uh, you know, we feel deserve better protection. Uh, some of them already are in that country or or other designations, but uh, uh, the uh, planning process <coughs> should consider uh, uh, better protection for, for those areas. And um, uh, that's one end of the spectrum. We're very focused on, uh, you know, the uh, inventory of potential wilderness areas, which uh, the Forest Service is uh, currently uh, uh, conducting uh, a draft of that came out in April. Uh, frankly, we were very dissatisfied with that. We didn't feel that the criteria had been carried out. Uh, we've heard from the Forest Service that a new version of that inventory is supposed to be out this week, so we're anxiously awaiting it. Uh, and those areas uh, will then go into an evaluation process for uh, consideration of wilderness recommendation, but also those areas should be candidates for other uh, designations such as backcountry and uh, other management designations that would protect their roadless values, their special uh, habitats, and uh, all the things that will be, you know, if you look at this, will be highlighted. We have uh, some of these, it's also at, uh, NC, uh, mountaintreasures.org. The, the other aspect is the uh, habitat issue. And um, uh, we basically support good ecological restoration. And uh, there's a huge opportunity for good ecological restoration. Uh, we feel that uh, this draft proposal that's currently out misses the mark in that, uh, you know, the um, a collaborative approach where we look at the real needs of the forest, 
the needs for protecting a lot of these areas is balanced uh, in a good way. And um, uh, unfortunately, the uh, uh, current proposal increases the amount of uh, uh, forest that's focused on timber production by over 160,000 acres. And uh, uh, Steve, you're uh, sitting there shaking your head, but timber production, as defined in the Forest Service's uh, proposal, is producing timber as a crop. And uh, we're very concerned about that and uh, feel that uh, the current proposal is extreme, it's unbalanced, and it really misses an opportunity to uh, construct a, a consensus and collaborative plan that would resolve some of these issues and not go back to uh, the framework of the 1980s when there was huge amount of conflict over these issues. Thanks, you. And uh, I think one of the issues you guys are concerned about as well, there's about 70,000 acres of designated wilderness, which is the highest form of public um, protection for land through the Wilderness Act of 50 years ago. And, and uh, there hasn't been any additions to that since 84. That's right. Um, Gordon, I want to turn it over to you. Uh, so about you, to fall asleep, man. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get it back over to you soon. If you could take a couple minutes to explain uh, a little bit about uh, the, the flip side of that and, and what you guys are interested for in well, from the wildlife perspective. Well, first and foremost, uh, we're advocating for wildlife. I mean, that's, that's what I get paid to do. So, so uh, no other agendas back behind all that other than, other than for wildlife. And so the question is, do we want to help wildlife on the national forest? Well, as I mentioned earlier, if that's what we want to do, then we're going to have to provide habitats for those wildlife. If we inherited the forest that we inherited, we got the situation that we have now. We've looked at that and made some assessments. I, I, didn't, I didn't make up the situation that we have now, but we, we've got a forest here with over 80% of the forest over, over 80 years old. And so that, that means certain things. That's good for some wildlife. That's not good for other, other, other wildlife. But Ryan, if you've got, where's, where's Ryan? Yeah, I, I brought a little graphic because this is so hard to explain uh, stuff here. Can I stand up? Is that yeah, little? yeah, sure, sure. It's not like I have microphones. Or, no, you're going to have to come up here, Ryan. Ryan doesn't like it. I'm a big ham. Ryan does all the work in the background. Yeah, so uh, so basically we, we, we want a forest that, that has diversity, that has all these wildlife species in there, whether it's sparrows and chestnut-sided warblers, golden wing warblers, uh, Hooded warblers, uh, uh, rose-breasted grosbeaks, including wood thrushes, oven birds, all the way up to worm-eating warblers, cerulean warblers, all, all points in between. And so what we've got here, succession is such a big and, and an important concept in wildlife. And so you, you plow up your garden. I'm going I'm to make a garden this year. I'm going to grow my own vegetables. Well, life gets busy, and, and all of a sudden you go out there in two months, and what, 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 what's going on with that soil? There's a bunch of green stuff in there. I'm not going to use the term weeds because sometimes weeds feed wildlife. But anyway, we start up early. And then what happens if you wait a few more months? Some more brushy stuff, some of those broom straw, that kind of thing. Go back next year, some shrubs, a few trees start to pop in there. These are what we call the sun lovers. They don't, they don't, they don't like to have canopy over it. So, so there's a bunch of species that are specific to these types of habitats. Things move along, trees start growing, they, they like to grow, and uh, we know that. They cut them at the turn of the last century, and now they're big, and you enjoy those trees. So now all of a sudden we get in mid-succession, 80 years old, all the way up through here, and then, and then finally through the, well, I'm going to knock my water over. Uh, finally, we get into what might be called old growth. And so you can see that I mentioned that 80% of our forest is, is right in the middle here. And you can see once the canopy closes over, there's not a whole lot of stuff under there. And that's good for some species. Other species are taking it on the chin. So that's, that's what we're looking at. In a word, we are, we are first and foremost for diversity. So whether it's, it's old growth at one end or early successional at the other and all points in between. So we're, we don't want to be mischaracterized as pushing for the, for the young end, the, the brushy end. Although right now, when you look at the forest, 
over 25 over 25 percent of the forest is is uh, in these, uh, these congressionally mandated areas. These areas are permanently protected. These areas are not going to have a timber harvest in there, and so these 25 percent of the area is, is presumably going to go to some old growth status. There's a lot of places on the Forest Service land that they can't get to that, that you will not uh, you will not cut timber in there. We can't even get in there. Even Adrian Paoletta, my top technician over here, she can't even get back there with her hiking boots and a chainsaw. So there's a lot of areas that will by default do that. We designated some of these areas. Our concern now is for the the early end of the spectrum, and uh, there's less than it's 0.6 percent to up to one percent depending on what you count and what you don't count. And that is up in, in these early stages. And one of the stages. one of the concerns that I've heard is that the the there are some limitations on any kind of timber harvesting practice that happens in the national forest, and so as you add. Other special designations that can become more difficult is one of the things that I've heard. Uh, so, yeah. I, and, and then uh, I've, I've got a quote from the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. It, in order to have diverse wildlife, it's absolutely necessary to have diverse habitat. Diverse habitat, diverse wildlife. So, <laughs> can, I, but, can I make a crucial point? Yes. Okay, uh, well, I, 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 I don't want to cut yours. you off, Gordon, so I'll finish if you had something. Yeah, I mean, but I, I, I want to respond to what you said. So anyway, uh, uh, so early successional habitat, and again, it's this pendulum. We, we don't want to cut down the whole forest, but the, the, these habitats uh, that we're talking about are in short supply. The, the, the natural disturbance factors, some of the private lands factors are not providing these habitats. There's, there's, this is really hard to do in a very short period of time. If any of you all want me to come and talk for about 30 or 45 minutes, and I can explain it. You, can you take about 30 seconds? Yeah. So we can move the, on the crucial. But I'm, I'm not done. The, so. <laughs> no, go, go, go. Can we, let's pop it over to you. you can pop and it I want to turn it back I'm, over to Angie to do some questions. But I, 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 that's yeah. only one while. I've, I've just got to, I really need to finish that. I'll, I'll give you a second there. The, 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 the crucial point yeah. is that that graph, graphic that Gordon showed illustrated the great consensus that could come out of this because all of, most of our forest is suffering from the result of long-term, even age, rotational forestry. And so you have early succession, uh, you know, succeeding, uh, and most of it is middle age. But, uh, you know, timber production unfortunately is targeted at the right side of that, at the old growth, which is also the most rare stage of the forest, rather than that middle ground where, you know, the species diversity is altered, the structure is altered, and true ecological restoration, which is not timber production, would focus on that middle ground creating some of that early succession habitat, but preserving, you know, that old growth in, which is very rare. So, Gordon, 20 yeah. more seconds for you, then oh, I'm going to turn it back over to Angie. Really fair. Uh, uh, we, are not, we are not targeting timber production in the, in the, in the old growth the areas, the areas that are over 130 years old. We, we all talk about, you know, that, that middle zone, 70 to 100 years old. But for the, for the key species that we're talking about, the golden wing warbler at one end, We've got to open these stands up, and a lot of these are not going to be just, just they're not clear cutting. The Forest Service doesn't clear cut. This term logging keeps coming up, and the, the, it's, it's absolutely inaccurate. It's not logging like the logging of the 70s that conjures up that photo. It's, it, this is scientific forestry. This is forestry with a purpose based on scientific silviculture. Look the word silviculture up. It's, it's a, there's a huge science behind this. And, and some of the structures we, we would create for the Golden Wing Warbler would, would actually result in all age distributions that might be all growth's not the only way to get that that structure. You can you can induce some of these, these structural things by other techniques. And the same with the cerulean warbler. The cerulean warbler in the middle of that doesn't like the, 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 the close canopy that we have. Now the cerulean warbler and a host of species with that needs to have a structure that might look like old growth. Yeah. We can't wait for the old growth so we're we're going to need to go in there. And the Forest Service is not going to build a bunch of roads. They're not, going to, they're not going to engage in industrial logging, and they're not going to log or, or, or cut timber near areas where people have trails. And so the, uh, the, the, the Forest Service now is, 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 is like Crystal said, is, is engaged in ecological restoration, purposeful forestry. We're the birthplace of forestry here. We, we, we've, got it. we've got a whole science behind us, and the science and wildlife management, 
we can apply these things and manage for diversity. And, and you know, we might even have some fun along the way. I mean, you know, as you're walking along a trail and some of these things are going along as you're, as you're on your horse or you're, you're biking or you're looking around, as Kevin said, it's about the experience. You might actually see more wildlife out there. You're going to see a diversity of wildlife species. Um, you know, it's, 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 about, it's about the whole, the whole spectrum here. But we've really got to open up some of these closed canopy forests and we've got to create some of these, these open areas. Uh, yeah. it's, 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 it's real important. I'm not just making that up. Look at the American Bird Conservancy site website, American Bird Conservancy. It's not, uh, it's not going to I don't mean to cut you off, but I want to save some time for some questions. And in the middle of this is the Forest Service, whose the two pillars are getting public engagement and uh, using the best science to figure out how to do it. Good luck, you guys. This is going to be interesting. But I'm going to turn it over to, to Angie. You guys, thank you, panel, for your questions. I want to.